Hey microbiology students, this is our second lecture video within lecture 17 on eukaryotic pathogens. This lecture video is on parasitic protozoa. Most parasitic protozoa live in water or they live inside of animal bodies. On the screen here we see one such example of a parasitic protozoan. This protozoan is called a parabecium. And you may have seen this before in laboratory classes because it is a very common protozoan that lives in freshwater ponds and streams. Have you ever looked at pond water under the microscope? Well, your answer should be yes because we did a lab at the very beginning of the term where you should have seen some of these guys swimming around under the microscope. Now, these are much bigger than bacterial cells and much bigger than yeast. These cells range in size from 50 micrometers to upwards of 300 to 400 micrometers in size. So if you haven't seen these guys or don't remember what they look like under the microscope swimming around, let's actually recall that very important lab exercise and let's look at a drop of pond water together under the microscope and see all of the exciting swimming around protozoa that live in a drop of pond water. So if you have one minute to spare, I would recommend we take a look at this together. Okay, did that bring back some memories? Back in the old days when you used to look under microscopes? Yeah. So let's talk more about these parasites. So these are, of course, single-celled or unicellular eukaryotic parasites. They go by the name of protozoa. And that was a name that was coined by one of the very first scientists to see these under the microscope back in the 17th century. Protozoa means before animals. And the reason why the scientist gave these microbes the name protozoa is that he observed animal-like behavior in these single-celled organisms. They would chase each other. They were modal. They moved. They ate each other. So it's almost like watching a microscopic safari that's just occurring at the single celled level rather than multicellular tigers and lions chasing gazelles. Okay, where do we find these protozoans? Freshwater, lake streams, ponds? or inside of animals or humans, inside of the digestive tract, perhaps inside the reproductive system, or blood. They all act as obligate pathogens. 
So if they're in the body, they're not doing you any benefits. Um, they're definitely causing harm in some way, even if the person is asymptomatic. Reproduction is asexual, although in some cases, sexual reproduction occurs. What that means is that unique gamete cells that are male or female can combine to form a genetically unique offspring. So the life cycle stages for protozoans, there's two stages in the life cycle. Not all protozoans have both of these stages. So trophozoite is the term we use for the modal feeding, reproducing form of the parasite. So this is the form that you see swimming around. All protozoans have at least this stage in their life cycle. This is a very important stage. So methods of motility for trophozoites vary from species to species, and you saw some of that in that introductory video. Pictured in the middle of the screen, let's take a look at this trophozoite. See, it's labeled trophozoite. Acantamoeba, amoeba, trophozoite. So do you recall the method of movement for amoebas? Well, amoebas do not have a defined shape. We call them amorphous. They look just like blobs. If you think back, we saw an amoeba in class under the microscope. However, I put an example of an amoeba under that dark field microscope we have in the lab. And hopefully you saw the movement strategy of the amoeba. If so this has been time lapse, so sped up because really amoebas move very slowly, just oozing slowly towards their prey. So this has been sped up just to show you that movement. Uh, more rapidly, but this movement would be referred to as pseudopodia. So movement by pseudopodia. What does that word mean? Well, pseudo means fake and pod means foot. So fake feet is literally what it translates to. And that's just an oozing movement. So it just pushes its cytoplasm in different um, directions, sort of like little feet moving it, itself towards its prey. How about the trophozoite form we see here? This is another form of a trophozoite. This trophozoite would be a ciliated trophozoite. So the method of motility refers to these short little hairs that we call cilia. The third form of motility we see in the trophozoite forms of the protozoans would be flagella. So just like bacterial cells, just like sperm cells, flagella refer to a tail, there can be multiple tails of protein fibers that help in propelling the cell forward. So like I said, all of the, all of the parasite, parasitic protozoans have a trophozoite stage. The second type of stage is only found in some groups of parasitic protozoans, and it's called the cyst stage. The cysts do not move, so we call them non-modal. They're dormant. It's a protective dormancy stage that some of these parasites form in order to sur survive a harsh environment or a lack of food. It does not cause disease in this form. On this slide, we could see the, uh, the alternate form of the acanthamoeba is the cyst. And so it can alternate, let's put a double headed arrow here because it can alternate from the cyst stage to the trophozoite stage. Cysts are usually 
either circular or um, they look sort of like seeds under the microscope with several layers of protective protein coating that enables the cyst to survive well outside the body. So protozoan parasites that live outside of the human body or the animal body, let's say in soil or water, you would find those types of parasites to have a cyst say, a stage. What does that cyst stage remind you of? That's right, it's a lot like bacterial spores. Very similar because remember bacterial spores are formed when bacteria undergo a dormant stage, not a reproductive stage. So this is not how they reproduce. Reproduction for protozoans occurs in the trophozoite stage, either asexually or sexually. Let's write on here too for cysts. We'll say some. Some of them have the cyst stage. Okay, let's start with some examples. We'll start with Trichomonas vaginalis. This is a very common uh, protozoan that causes a sexually transmitted infection that's called trichomoniasis, or sometimes it's just called trick. So trichomonas is transmitted by vaginal sexual intercourse. So it infects the mucous membranes of the reproductive system. In men, that would be the urethra, and in women, that would be the vagina. So symptoms include perhaps discharge, irritation, and itching, although notice here my statistics that nearly half of women are asymptomatic, where almost 100% of men are asymptomatic. Let's take a look at that live. So here we're seeing live trichomonas parasites taken from a vaginal swab of an infected female. Do you recognize the method of motility? <clears throat> That's right, trichomonas is flagellated. It actually has a flagella that wraps around the body of the cell that almost looks like lace around the body of the single-celled organism. So it's flagellated. Do you think that trichomonas has a cyst? stage to its life cycle. No, Trichomonas vaginalis does not have a cyst stage. Why doesn't it have a cyst stage? Well, it's because transmission of these active modal uh, trophozoites does not occur outside of the body. It's only mucous membrane to mucous membrane transmission. So there's no need for the parasite to be able to survive in water or soil, for example. Doesn't survive on surfaces either. Home remedy is a vinegar rinse. Why would that be helpful? Well, vinegar is acetic acid, which is, has a very low pH and can actually denature proteins. So that can be an effective first attempt to eliminate this parasite. So complications associated with trichomoniasis. Well, the World Health Organization lists that the complications of infection with trich trichomonas is that this increases your likelihood of co-infection with other infectious agents like HIV, for example. For women who are infected with trichomonas, it also increases their risk for delivery of babies preterm. Here's the giant microbe form 
of this parasite. They've got the flagella wrapped around as well as on one side. And boy, sad face, huh? Yeah, sort of a sad face makes sense. Not a good idea to come down with trichomoniasis and not be treated. Let's move on to another example of a parasitic protozoan. This is Giardia intestinalis. You can see here the trophozoite form in these pictures. You can also tell clearly that the trophozoite form of Giardia is flagellated. Here on the left, we're looking at dozens of Giardia trophozoites attached to the intestinal wall. So like the name suggests, Giardia intestinalis infects the intestines by burrowing into the wall of the intestines, triggering inflammation of the intestines and chronic diarrhea that can last one to two weeks, sort of mucus, um, uh, mucus uh, stools, dysentery. Here's the giant microbe form looking a little cuter there. Let's take a closer look at this parasite under the microscope. So here we see the trophozoite form and this does have a cyst form. Why does it have a cyst form? Well, this is a parasite that exists in nature. It exists in the environment, in freshwater streams and lakes, and it's passed in the feces of animals. So if animals are passing their feces into stream and lake water, then the cyst form of Giardia is present. Under the microscope, if you're looking for Giardia, you can find it in what we call a fecal smear or a sample from somebody's feces or an infected animal. This does infect animals, including your pets. So it is possible for your dogs to contract Giardia if you go on hikes in the woods and they drink uh, the stream water and then later have diarrhea that would likely be caused by Giardia parasites. So looking at a smear under the microscope, we can see the cyst form of this parasite. The cyst form of this parasite looks a lot like an almond shape, sort of like a seed, looks like seeds under the microscope. The trophozoite form, like we saw on this slide here, these are all the trophozoites. The trophozoite form has a very characteristic appearance as well. So it has two nuclei that look like eyes. And eight flagella where we have four on one side and four on the other. So transmission is fecal to oral. The cysts are consumed. So from one cyst, two modal trophozoites can be produced. So from one cyst, we can produce two new trophozoites. So those trophozoites would come out a dormant stage. Remember, cyst is a dormant stage. So they would come from one of the cysts that you would ingest, okay, from either drinking contaminated water or potentially fomites that are contaminated with the cysts. So you would ingest the cyst and then the cysts would would release these two trophozoites that would be causing the illness and would attach to the intestinal walls. So this is one to two weeks of chronic diarrhea with mucus in the stools, a severe form of diarrhea that we would call dysentery. 
this is very unpleasant to experience, as you can imagine. So patients will likely seek, seek out medical attention for this condition. So the medication of choice is an antiprotozoan medication called Flagyl. Flagyl is a nucleic acid inhibitor. And one of the problems with antiprotozoan medications is that they do have side effects in the patient. Why would that be? Well, the cell structure of these eukaryotic pathogens is actually pretty similar to your own cells. These are eukaryotes that do not have cell walls. So the structures as well as the metabolism of these cells are very closely related to our cells. And so that is one of the disadvantage, disadvantages of antiprotozoan medications compared to other types of medications that are more selectively toxic. But that's really pathogen dependent. Okay, moving on. The brain eating amoeba. This one sounds really scary. I like to put this one in, however, it's very rare in occurrence compared to actually going back to Giardia real quick here for epidemiology. So Giardia infects about 33% of the world's population, mostly in third world countries. So it is a problem in third world countries because fecally contaminated sewage very frequently can, gets into the water supply, gets into the drinking water. So people are drinking these cysts and then that leads to the Giardia infection. In the United States, there's only about 15,000 cases a year on average of Giardia. So let's compare that in epidemiology to the brain-eating amoeba. Here we're seeing a warning sign that's posted outside of a hot spring. It says, warning, do not allow water to enter your nose. Negleria phalari, an amoeba common to thermal pools, may enter causing a rare infection and death. So this does cause a very significantly deadly and fast acting disease called primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. That's a mouthful. Let's just abbreviate it PAM, okay? It actually is abbreviated PAM. So it causes a severe brain infection. That's very fast acting. The good news is it's very rare. There have only been 143 cases reported in the United States since it was first identified in 1962. However, out of those 143 cases, only two people have survived. So it's almost always fatal. The reason is that it's very fast acting and it resembles meningitis, like bacterial meningitis, so a lot of times it's misdiagnosed as bacterial meningitis, and then the patients are treated with antibiotics. And antibiotics, are they gonna be effective against a eukaryotic pathogen? Good, <laughs> no, antibiotics are not effective against eukaryotic pathogens like amoebas. There is a medication that does effectively treat this infection, but it has to be administered 24 hours after exposure. This is a very narrow window of time. And the incubation period for the amoeba can sometimes be 24 hours. So this is why it's very, very difficult to diagnose and properly get treatment in a rapid fashion. So how does this get transmitted? So it is a, it's a thermophilic 
amoeba. What that means is that it loves warm water. So warm water rivers and lakes, especially in the summertime in certain parts of the United States like Texas, where the rivers get really warm, or natural uh, thermal hot springs. What you want to keep in mind is that, of course, in areas where it's known, and there are warnings like this posted around, what you should know is that you should not be submerging your head in the water. The parasite enters through the nose. So it enters through the nose, travels to the brain via the olfactory nerve, and death occurs with usually within 12 days, with the incubation period being somewhere between 24 to 48 hours. Here is the trophozoite form of Negleria phalari in a blood smear. We see a whole bunch of uh, neutrophils after it, trying to get it. This parasite does have a virulent strategy, which is it forms a cyst inside of the brain and protects itself from the immune system, hiding within the cyst. The immune system then swarms and attacks the cyst, and then the trophozoite negleria will just hatch out of that cyst and then migrate once again freely throughout the brain, sort of undetected. The Giant Microbes Company does a pretty cute idea here to demonstrate this parasite. They show you the two different forms. I love that. They show us the trophozoite. It is an amoeba. So here's the trophozoite amoeba form. This is the modal form. This is the form that um, is here. This would be also the trophozoite form there. They do a pretty good job making it look like the actual parasite, don't they? And then this is the cyst form. So this has a cyst form. The cyst forms can, usually what happens is it actually forms a cyst to evade the immune response. So it can alternate from cyst to trophozoite form. And we consider this strategy to be a virulence strategy because it allows for the parasite to evade the immune response. The reason being is that the proteins on the surface of the cyst will be recognized by this adaptive immune response and then targeted. But then as it emerges as a trophozoite, it's wearing a whole different surface protein or antigens. So it's a way that the parasite can alternate its surface proteins and evade the immune re response. Here we see a patient who developed the complication, the deadly comp uh, complication, which is the PAM, the primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. So we see the healthy brain on the left, labeled A, and we see the diseased brain. Oh no, actually, sorry, both of these are the diseased brain. We've just zoomed in on it. So we zoom in on this region of the brain that has been literally liquefied. So the amoeba in its trophozoite form uh, feeds on the brain tissue and sort of turn, turns that brain into, um, into mush. So the symptoms of this disease well, it starts very much like meningitis when we talked about bacterial meningitis. So it starts with a stiff, sore neck, a headache, a, maybe a low-grade fever. And then very rapidly, within a few days, the person is in a coma and then dies. And unfortunately, treatment does not seem to be effective um, in the later stage of this illness mostly because it's very difficult to deliver medication effectively to the brain 
because you have to cross the blood brain barrier. And the parasite can cross the blood brain barrier, but it's hard for us to get our medications across. And it doesn't seem to be as effective. So really within the first 24 hours of exposure is when um, the only two people who have survived this infection was um, they received immediate treatment in time. Okay, so now we're going to transition to blood pathogens. So these are parasitic protozoans that infect the blood and are transmitted by insect vectors. So there are two groups we're going to look at. First, we'll look at um, parasites within the genus called trypanosoma. Sometimes they're just referred to as trypanosomes. So trypanosomes are transmitted by um, a couple different insect vectors. We'll take a look at the specific um, insects in a moment here. And these are considered extracellular pathogens. Notice that word here. What does that mean? Well, it means that in these blood smears, so when we're looking at a blood smear under the microscope, We are looking at red blood cells here. And then the parasite, the trypanosome, is outside of the blood. In other words, it does not invade the blood cell directly. It's on the outside of the blood. They are flagellated. Notice it has. It has that same sort of wraparound flagella. Uh, spindle shaped, they look almost like worms, but they're not worms, they're single celled protozoans. No vaccinations for trypanosomes, none that have worked. The main re reason being is the mutation rate of the parasite. So, antigenic variation is a very um, successful virulence strategy for parasites and for any pathogen, really. You just keep changing your surface uh, appearance and you, you keep the immune system a step behind you and trying to identify you and, and kill you. Once again, treatment is available. It is expensive. This is a disease of uh, Africa as well as Central and South America. We do not have the vectors for trypanosoma infections here in North America. So if we do have infections, they're rare in the United States and it's only from people who have traveled to parts of the world where there are the native vectors for these pathogens. So severe um, it's not selectively toxic, the treatment. In other words, it doesn't effectively just be, it isn't it effectively just toxic to the parasite. It does have side effects in the patient. So let's look at the two different species of trypanosoma and the diseases that they cause. So this species is called trypanosoma brucei. Trypanosoma brucei is indistinguishable from any other form, any other species of trypanosoma in terms of the microscopic morphology. They all look the same under the microscope. The only difference is the vector as well as the illness that's caused by the particular species. So trypanosoma brucei causes the disease called African sleeping sickness. The giant microbe form of this parasite has our nice flagella and has the eyes closed because, of course, it's sleeping sickness. Here's the vector. The vector is called a tsetse fly. This is a related fly to horse flies. They do bite. They are only found in parts of Africa the ones that carry the 
trypanosoma parasite. So the parasite is transmitted into the bloodstream by a bite caught of the CT fly. What happens is then the parasite moves from blood to lymph to nervous system, eventually causing the infected person to go into a coma and then die, usually within a few months of infection, it, unless they're treated. So the other species of trypanosoma is trypanosoma crudsi. And so if you'll notice, let's go back a slide again. Here was trypanosoma brucei. Here is trypanosoma crudsi. They are like evil twins of each other. They look the same morphologically. And in fact, if you'll notice, all I did was change the last name of this trypanosome. Basically, I changed the species name. It's not Brucei now, it's Kruzzi. But morphologically, we can't tell the difference. They both look the same. Um, usually they stain sort of a purple color, but what giant microbes tried to do is actually make it a different color, the one that causes Chagas disease here, Trypanosoma Kruzzi. So morphologically the same, but different vector and different illness, okay? So the vector here is a different type of bug. It's called a triatoma bug. So it's oftentimes referred to as the kissing bug. I don't think I'd wanna get a kiss from this bug though. It gets that name because it could climb over your face when you're sleeping and bite you. This, this particular bug is only found in certain areas of Central and South America. The disease that this parasite causes is very different than the disease caused by its evil twin, Trypanosoma brucei. So trypanosoma crudsi causes Chagas disease. And this is very slow acting. Oftentimes with the death doesn't occur for many years, even decades after the initial infection. So it progresses from blood and eventually into the heart muscle. And there it causes an inflammatory response in the heart muscle that we say is slow and progressive. So it takes a long time for eventually the heart muscle to be so severely damaged from the infection that it causes heart failure and death. It's guessed that Charles Darwin, the very famous uh, founder of the theory of evolution, first person to write about theory of evolution, Charles Darwin, it suspected that he actually had Chagas disease. If you know anything about Charles Darwin's life, in the early part of his life, he spent a lot of time on a ship called the HMS Beagle, and he traveled all over Africa and South America and Australia, and in parts of South America where Chagas disease is endemic, and he died decades later from a heart attack that is suspected to have been caused by Chagas disease. Okay, that brings us to our final blood pathogen we're gonna to discuss today. This is Plasmodium. Plasmodium causes malaria. Let's talk about malaria. 300 to 500 million new cases every year. 89% of those cases occur in Africa. Malaria kills approximately 400,000 people every year, mostly African children. So transmission of malaria is also vector. The vector is a very specific species of mosquito. It's the Anopheles mosquito, and it's only the female, not the male. 
the male mosquitoes, they do not have the right um, mouth parts to bite you. So they can't bite you. <laughs> so females have the correct mouth parts to bite you and transmit the infection. So this type of mosquito is not found in the United States. It's only found in parts of Africa. So the vector has to be present in order to transmit that infection. Very, very rarely would it be transmitted any other way than just the vector. So there are many different species of plasmodium that uh, can cause malaria. So there are other parts of the world that have their own variants of the plasmodium parasite and also of the vector. So malaria, the life cycle of this parasite is very complicated with many stages. That's one of the reasons why treatment and prevention has been very difficult for malaria and why these numbers of infections are so high and the death rate is so high. So both humans and mosquitoes are reservoirs in the life cycle. We'll take a look at that life cycle in a moment. Characteristic symptoms of malaria, fever, chills, vomiting, severe headache. This process repeats every two to three days. So you have periods of asymptomatic feeling good and then two to three days later, you have your fever, chills, and vomiting episodes. This is specifically timed with a stage in the life cycle of the parasite where the patient's red blood cells have lysed. Basically, they break open and release a whole bunch of new baby parasites that go and invade more red blood cells. Mortality, 20 to 50% without treatment. And the death occurs because of this lysis of the red blood cells. That is called severe anemia. Now let's look at the life cycle. This is showing you the life cycle of Plasmodium falciparum, which is the most common form of Plasmodium that is found in Africa. Let's take a look at the different life cycle stages. And in this diagram, we're also seeing vaccine targets, ways in which vaccines have tried to attempt to prevent the transmission of this infection. So let's start with step one. The mosquito injects sporozoites into the bloodstream. So sporozoites are the first form of the parasite. And they're these spindle-shaped structures. So the mosquito bites you and the sporozoites get into your blood. They don't directly invade the blood cells first, though. They go directly to the liver. Now, this vaccine that's described here, um, Moscirix, this vaccine, this is the one that has shown the most promise and is currently in phase four clinical trials. It attacks the sporozoite stage or protects against the sporozoite stage. And that's the earliest stage in the infection cycle. So that makes sense it would block the ability of those sporozoites to get into the liver. This is also the stage where the medication um, chloroquine is utilized. So there is a preventative medication here that targets the sporozoite stage. So chloroquine is a medication and it can be given um, prior to infection. So if somebody knows they're going to be going into a malaria zone, uh, traveling to Africa, they can be prescribed chloroquine medication as a preventative. So you take this tablet every day, this pill, and that keeps the chloroquine medication at a high enough levels in your bloodstream that if you did happen to be bitten by a mosquito, it would kill the sporozoite stage of the parasite before it could invade your liver. So it's used as a preventative and a treatment. A 
Okay, second stage, the parasites replicate in the liver. Now they form the second major stage of the life cycle called the merozoites. So the merozoites, they rupture out of the liver and then they invade the blood cells, the red blood cells. So the parasites will replicate inside of those red blood cells and then they burst. And here's where those symptoms first develop, that fever and chills that repeats. And so more, this is going around and around in a circle because these merozoites are coming out of the lysed blood and then going back into blood and replicating and then lysing out of the blood. And this repeats every two to three days. Some of these merozoites go on to this third stage called the gametocyte stage. And this is the interesting part is that these red blood cells that are infected with the gametocyte stage of the parasite have to be picked up by another mosquito bite. So an un uninfected mosquito, this is how the mosquito gets infected. So it gets infected from the human that's acting as a reservoir. So it's these two very important hosts the mosquito and the human in propagating the replication of the plasmodium parasite. So this uninfected mosquito picks up red blood cells when it takes a blood meal from somebody who's infected with the parasite and it picks up these gametocytes. The gametocytes will mature into gamete cells inside of the mosquito and then fertilization occurs. So we end up with the zygote that then redevelops back into the sporozoites in the salivary glands of these infected mosquitoes and then the infected mosquitoes go and bite uninfected humans and release these sporozoites back into the blood and then that process continues. I would like you to be able to recognize the diagnostic blood smear for plasmodium. This, by the way, shows up as part of your lab 31, your parasitology lab this week. So in the parasitology lab, what we usually do is we give you guys some pre-made blood smears from people infected with malaria. And you look at these blood smears under the microscope and you look for the diagnostic form of plasmodium falciparum. And the diagnostic form, let's actually, let's highlight it for you. Okay, so inside, remember it's the red blood cells that are being infected, and that is actually uh, the, the primary uh, mechanism for which the parasite is replicating and also causing damage to the host. What you're looking for is this very characteristic ring form of the parasite. And it looks literally like a diamond ring. You see that? So it's like a diamond ring and here's the diamond. <laughs> so it looks like a very characteristic diamond ring inside of the red blood cell. So this is a red blood cell. This is why we consider plasmodium to be an intracellular parasite. So it's classified as intracellular parasite. Although, as a sporozoite, it is extracellular, but that's a very brief stage. So I'm talking about this stage here when, it, when, when a infected mosquito bites a human initially and, and injects these sporozoites. So, and then the sporozoites invade the liver. The rest of the life cycle, we're talking about the parasite is intracellularly um, it's an intracellular pathogen. So the sporozoite stage is a very brief stage in the life cycle. In fact, the sporozoite stage only lasts about 30 minutes. So it's only extracellular for about 30 minutes. <laughs> the rest of the time, it's intracellular. So that's why we call it intracellular. It replicates inside of the red blood cells. Down below here, we're seeing, we're seeing that replication occur where we get lots and lots of um, these nuclei forming, and we call that a schizont. And that's basically showing that we have the parasite is replicating inside here.
let's talk about prevention and treatment. So insect control, trying to reduce mosquito populations has definitely been a popper, popular method of trying to prevent sp uh, spread since it is a very uh, specific vector, the female Anopheles mosquito. We talked about this, the chloroquine pills. These kill the parasites in the sporozoite stage. Interestingly enough, many people in Africa have a genetic mutation. It's called the sickle cell mutation, and it alters the shape of their red blood cells. So these people have red blood cells that look sort of like bananas. Um, we call these sickled, sickle shape. So it's a sickle shaped red blood cell, as opposed to normally your red blood cells are round. So this arose as a genetic mutation and it's very common in people who live in Africa and people who live in, um, had, a, had a bee follow me into here. <laughs> um, and it's very common for people who, um, um, are of African descent. So they're not living in Africa, but their ancestors lived in Africa. We call that an example of natural selection. So it's an evolutionary explanation for why some, some people survive the malaria infections and others do not. Well, they happen to have a random genetic mutation in the hemoglobin gene that affects the shape of their red blood cells. And it turns out the parasites cannot invade the sickled blood. So research is currently underway to develop genetically modified mosquitoes. This is a really cool idea, I think. So the scientists here are trying to genetically modify the vector, right, the mosquito and they alter the female so that she becomes sterile and also genetically modifies her mouth parts. Because remember, the reason why the male mosquitoes do, do not transmit the infection to humans is that their mouth parts cannot bite our skin properly. So it genetically alters the female. So not only can they not, they can't lay uh, fertile eggs, but they also um, are unable to bite us. So this is really preliminary. They're testing this out in laboratories first. And there are concerns about unleashing a genetically modified mosquito into the wild as far as how that's the impacts of that, which could lead to death of all mosquitoes worldwide, which Personally, I think that sounds great. Do not like mosquitoes at all. So I would be cool with that. But some environmentalists are concerned about, there's something called, you know, the butterfly effect. Now these aren't butterflies, but the butterfly effect is a terminology that basically means if you alter one species, there's like this chain reaction that occurs in nature. So you alter the mosquitoes, well, who eats the mosquitoes? and who eats, what eats the mosquitoes, right? So that could ultimately lead to larger animals like birds, for example, um, not having food sources and you know this chain reaction in nature. So that's why it has to be carefully looked at and studied to understand the impacts that, that this would have on the environment. Probably most promising is the 2019, now we're in the uh, phase four trial, this was a, began in the fall of 2019, and this is the most promising vaccine candidate that we've ever seen for malaria. And they're, they're finishing this out with the phase four trial in Malawi on children. It's four doses though. So the child has to receive four doses. It's a subunit vaccine. It's a protein from the sporozoite is what they use as the antigen. And all four doses are necessary. However, it only 30% uh, effective at preventing malaria infection. So, and only seems to last about four, four years. And that's a product of 30 years of research. 
which gives you a little bit of a taste of how long vaccine trials can last. This malaria vaccine, 30 years of research, still not licensed, still not something you can go and get. It's just being, um, it's in its final stages of testing in Africa on the groups of people that are, you know, highest risk. So anyways, I hope that was um, interesting <laughs> about the parasitic protozoans as an example of a eukaryotic pathogens. We'll talk to you next time.